Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on treatment and intervention approaches for stony coral tissue loss disease. I'm Liz Shaver, and I'm the science lead for the Reef Resilience Network. And today, this webinar is being co-hosted with us with the Caribbean Cooperation Team for Florida's stony coral tissue loss disease response efforts. So I'm excited to turn things over now to our host, uh, Dana Wisinich Mendez, who's the co lead for the Caribbean Cooperation Team. Over to you, Dana. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar this afternoon. Uh, my name is Dana Wisinich Mendez, and I'm the webinar host, and as Liz said, the co lead of the Caribbean Cooperation Team. Um, Liz, can you go ahead and advance uh, to the next slide? Great, thank you. Um, so the Caribbean Cooperation Team is, is co-led by the NOAA Coral Program and Dr. Judy Lang of EDRA, the Atlantic and Gulf Reef Rapid Assessment. It's one of nine teams that make up um, the state of Florida's organized response effort to stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, our team was assembled in July of 2018 soon after the first appearance of stony coral tissue loss disease in Jamaica and in Mexico, which were the first Caribbean nations to observe the disease on their reefs. Um, the leader of the leadership of Florida's response efforts acknowledged early on sharing Florida's experience with the disease outbreak with our Caribbean coral reef conservation colleagues would be critical in our efforts to conserve Atlantic coral reef ecosystems. Um, the disease has now been observed in, in 10 different countries and territories in the Caribbean region. Scientists, resource managers, and, and conservation practitioners throughout the region are working to understand this disease, track its incidence and slow its spread. And the Caribbean Cooperation Team and its participating organizations are working facilitate the exchange of information and knowledge on stony coral tissue loss disease among the coral reef conservation community of managers, practitioners, and scientists in the region. Next slide, Liz. <clears throat> and so just to give you an idea of kind of the overall scope and the priorities of of the effort of the Caribbean Cooperation Team, we're working to try and maintain communications with regional networks and initiatives in order to track disease spread and distribute information um, on how to report um, the appearance of the disease, uh, to share lessons learned from ongoing response efforts, both in Florida and now within the Caribbean region, including intervention and treatment techniques, um, to share key informational products for distribution in the region and to help identify resources to support uh, response to the disease outbreak. Um, next slide. Oh, back up one, sorry. Back up, yeah. Um, so today, um, the Caribbean Coral Reef Conservation Community um, has expressed a need for resources and information on this newly observed coral disease as it spreads throughout the region, severely influencing Caribbean populations of almost half of our stony coral species, including many of our major reef builders in the region. And of particular interest among managers and conservation practitioners are the solutions, the options for treating stony coral tissue loss disease and curbing its spread. So today we will hear from four experts who have been working to develop and apply various intervention techniques to treat stony coral tissue loss disease. You will hear about successes and failures of various tried techniques, learn about new treatment options and development that hold promise, and have the opportunity to pose questions to our expert panelists, both during the webinar and after. Next slide. So before we begin, um, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded and it will be one hour and 30 minutes long. There will be a question and answer period at the end of all four presentations. There will also be opportunity for additional Q&A online on the Reef Resilience Network Forum, 
which is an interactive online community of coral reef managers and experts from around the world. At the end of the webinar, we'll provide instructions on how you can participate. There are two ways you can ask questions during the Q&A session. You can use the question box anytime throughout the webinar to send questions and we will keep track of these for the end of the presentations. Or two, you can raise your hand during the question and answer session and I'll call on you to ask your question during that time. You raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the toolbar next to your name. And if you're having technical difficulties such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, go ahead, type a message into the question box and we will try and help you resolve the issue. Um, so with that, let's move on to our, our presentations. Our first speaker for this webinar is Dr. Karen Neely. She is a research scientist at Nova Southeastern University and based out of the Florida Keys. She's extensively involved with disease intervention strategies, including application of treatments to infected wild corals. She has also worked extensively with pillar corals including coordinating coral rescue and spawning projects for the species. Within the Florida disease response effort, she is the co-lead of the reconnaissance and intervention team, as well as a member of the research and Caribbean coordination team. So those are a few of the, of the nine teams I referred to earlier. So let's hand it over to Karen. Hey there. Uh, thanks, Dana and Liz. Can you guys confirm that you can see your see my screen and hear me? Yes and yes. All right, great. Thanks so much. And thanks to everybody for being here this afternoon. Um, as Dana mentioned, I'm with Nova Southeastern University and sharing some of our experiences with in, on, in water intervention with you today. Um, as the first presenter, I've also been asked to do kind of a Sony Coral Tissue Loss Disease 101 just to get everybody on the same page. There's been a lot of work done on this and a ton of ongoing work. There's some references listed in here that I would encourage you to check out if you need further information on any of these particular topics. Um, so to start out, stony coral tissue loss disease is characterized by focal or multifocal lesions. Those are characterized as acute or subacute with a spread of up to four centimeters per day. And in some species, there's frequently a bleached margin that precedes that lesion. So the image on the top right there is an example from the um, stony coral tissue loss identification guide, which is also available on the agro website, which can help show the ways that this disease can appear upon different species. Uh, stony coral tissue loss disease started near Miami and spread throughout the Florida reef tract. Uh, there have been various studies that have tried to characterize this rate of spread, and it's been noted uh, as, as regionally varying between 2.5 and 15 kilometers per month across the Florida Reef Tract. Uh, Greta Abbey and Val Paul, who you'll hear from later, and their team did some uh, excellent work, including the characterization of the transmission of this disease, and that reference is uh, there for further information. Um, kind of the take-home points for this, they did some laboratory studies showing that Stony coral tissue loss disease could very easily spread by two colonies that are touching each other, but also to non-touching colonies through sterile seawater, and that that transmission is possible through uh, inter, both inter and intra specifically. Uh, there's the big elephant in the room of what actually is the pathogen. There's a ton of work going into this. Um, as many of you are probably aware, fulfilling Koch's postulates for Coral pathogens is extremely difficult. Many diseases that have been around for decades, the pathogen still hasn't been identified, but there is a, a large effort to try to do that with this species. Um, there's been some work, Julie Meyer and all looked at bacterial communities um, at the lesion on unaffected tissue and healthy colonies. Stephanie Rosales and her team did some work with that and also looking at sediment and water samples in affected and unaffected sites. Sort of the take home points here, there are bacterial differences between those healthy and diseased tissue. There's bacterial differences in the water and sediment um, between those healthy and unhealthy sites, but no pathogen has been positively confirmed and that work is still ongoing. Uh, we have more data on the ecosystem impacts. We know that over 20 species are affected. The notable exceptions are the acroporids and the parietes, which do not seem to be susceptible to this, um, but most of the other reef building species are. 
We do know that on susceptible species, we get about 66 to 100% mortality. You can see that figure in the bottom right. That's from Bill Pretz 2016 paper showing the localized extinction of many of those species within his plots. Um, we have also documented near regional extinction of gender gyro throughout the state of Florida. Just to give a visual of what that looks like, here is a site before stony coral tissue loss disease, and here's that same site after stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, unfortunately, as Dana mentioned, this has not been confined to Florida, and new observations are occurring uh, throughout different parts of the Caribbean. This map is kept up to date on the Agro website, and we encourage everyone to submit both positive and negative observations of stony coral tissue loss to this map for the benefit of everyone and to keep this up to date. So as this, as stony coral tissue loss disease uh, became more and more of a topic and people were realizing that this had a large regional spread, a large temporal spread that doesn't seem to slow down during the winter, there was a lot of conversation about, is there anything we can do for affected corals that are in the water? So literature review notes that there are various things that have been tried. A lot of them are mechanical, trying to separate healthy from diseased tissue shading, aspiration, smothering the diseased area, uh, creating fire breaks. Uh, there have been chemical additions to that, um, for example, adding chlorine to uh, smothering or trenched areas. Um, antibiotics have been used largely diagnostically to determine uh, if bacteria were a related pathogen. Um, and then there's been some work with phage therapy, in which case the uh, there's a specific phage that's targeted uh, for the pathogen that can be added to that particular coral. Um, the kicker there, of course, is that you have to know the pathogens to be able to do that. But this gave us a starting point to look at potential options for treatments in uh, a laboratory in the field setting. So we did some pretty extensive laboratory work, um, trying some of these different methodologies. What you're looking at here, this graph, is the failure rates. So when we left um, when we left corals that were diseased untreated, uh, we ended up with 97% failure, which is no big surprise. It turns out a lot of those mechanical barriers were no more effective than untreated controls, so trenching, smothering, trenching and smothering, none of those were effective. When we added powdered chlorine to the um, to trenches or to the smothering compounds, uh, again, that did very little to lower failure rates. When we started working with antibiotics, we did see greater success, lower failure rates, um, but that was really dependent on what the antibiotics were mixed into, so the delivery mechanism, which Mike is going to talk about more later. Uh, but notably, clay and epoxy were not effective, but when we started using specially formulated compounds, we got down into much, uh, much higher effective rates. The gold standard there, of course, is 0% failure, um, and antibiotic water dosing can still be used on corals that are being held in aquaria. Um, but that's obviously not something that is, uh, is practicable in the field. So using these particular uh, successes and failures, we were able to go out and, and do some field operations. Uh, this is a dashboard that Florida Fish and Wildlife has recently put together. The link is there if you want to see what's going on with interventions in Florida. Um, and you can see we've treated almost 3,000 corals um, with various mechanisms. The top right part there, you can see the division between those have been treated with antibiotics, those where the chlorinated epoxy was applied. Um, Val's going to talk a little bit about the probiotic treatments later, and then we did some experimental treatments as well. So I want to point out that most of the work, well, really all of the work that has been done in Florida is done in areas where there's already very high levels of infection and also where the chance of reinfection from upstream sources is very likely. We get a lot of questions as to what should I do on my particular reef? And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of experience with your particular reef or even the status of your reef. So we've sort of laid out this matrix in an idea of things you might want to consider. Um, for example, that potential for, potential for reinfection, if it's quite high, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to be able to halt disease at a reef scale. And so that focus might be more on saving priority corals. Um, the difference between high and low prevalence there being on what species are actually still available for you to, to try to save. If that potential for reinfection is low, then there might be an opportunity to stop that pathogen. Um, unfortunately, again, we've never been in a position to try that, um, but it might be worth thinking about whether you have the capacity to get into an area, not just with the goal of saving priority corals, but with potentially eliminating the pathogen from that area in the hope that that reinfection will not occur anytime soon. 
So in our situation where the main goal is to think about priority coral selection, uh, we met with a bunch of managers and sat down and said, well, what does make a priority coral? And a couple of, of groupings sort of came out. One is ecological, thinking about which ones are the structure building species, are they large corals, um, and then what's their reproductive potential? Uh, there's some regulatory considerations that rose to the top, things like iconic corals, ones that dive shops go to, um, ones that the various stakeholders have a vested interest in, also ESA listed corals. And then one that ends up being super important underwater is how treatable these particular corals are. How much bang for your buck are you going to get? Is it worth spending a long time on that one coral to save a lot of tissue or because that particular one is, uh, is easily treatable or very difficult to treat? So here's the results of all of those different um, experimental efforts. Um, so this is basically the, the percent of lesions that were halted using various treatments. So the control over there on the left, none of the lesions were halted. They all continued unabated. Um, Ocean Alchemist provided us with six different non-antibiotic compounds, and those are listed there above the arrow. Um, you can see success rates there are quite low, and in fact, those are statistically no different from the untreated controls. Um, chlorine had a 52% success rate at one month, um, but I'll dive a little bit further into that in a minute. We did try the placebo of B2B as the base 2B. That's our primary delivery mechanism for antibiotics. Um, so we did try the placebo as a smothering effect, which again was no different from controls. Um, and then the amoxicillin plus the base 2B. We have over 93% effectiveness on that uh, one month after treatment. So comparing that chlorine and the amoxicillin base 2B, even though at one month chlorine looks kind of promising, what's actually happening is it seems to take a while for that disease to move not only past that margin treatment, but those are also fire breaks. You can see in the photos on the left, we put a, a clump of chlorinated epoxy over the lesion and then also dig a fire break around that and pack that with chlorinated epoxy. So it takes a few months to move past both of those barriers. Um, but by three months, we see that the, the chlorinated epoxy failure rates are over 90%, um, whereas the amoxicillin is still holding strong. And in fact, we have one-year data. The lesion treatments of the amoxicillin are, uh, stay over 85% throughout the course of a full year. So this is some work done by Brian Walker up in um, southeast Florida. Uh, they have a slightly different situation where they have uh, fewer remaining corals than we do, and so in their, their case, it makes some sense to put more time and effort into saving those remaining corals. Um, and so they take the time to do a fire break uh, in addition to the margin level treatment and have found an increase in success associated with that, um, but all sort of encourage people to think about what your capacity is and how much time you're willing to spend on one particular coral versus how many corals you need to actually be out there trying to treat. So at this point, amoxicillin is our best recommended practice for lesion level um, treatments to try to save priority corals. Just a few details on that. This is a powdered amoxicillin that is hand mixed into this base 2B product. It's mixed in a one to eight by, rate, by weight ratio. Um, once it's mixed, the product has a relatively short shelf life. So we actually do this the morning of treatments. Our amoxicillin, we sort, the resource is a 98% purity. Um, we've had a lot of questions about whether that is, uh, whether it needs to be that high. We don't have a great answer to that. Um, Biscayne used a different product. It was a veterinary fish amoxicillin uh, and had much lower success rates. So they're transferring back to the same, uh, the same treatment that we use. Um, but if you have additional, uh, if you try something different, we'd be really interested to hear what, what those success rates are for you. Um, on average, we use about 12 milliliters of the base per coral, which equates to 1.6 grams of amoxicillin. Uh, one jar of the base will treat on average 37 corals. But it's worth noting the variability of that is incredibly high. There are corals that sometimes only require one or two milliliters, just a, a quick smudge of it, whereas a really large, heavily infected babylata um, can, can take 50 or 60 milliliters. The application is relatively simple. We pack everything into um, 60 cc catheter syringes and basically squeeze a bead of that along the disease margin um, and press that down into the coral skeleton to allow it to adhere. It, it expands into the cracks of that and that's the adherent property. So this is what that looks like. 
as you're smearing, you want to be particularly careful to get around the edges, as you can see Emily doing well right here. Um, also down into cracks and crevices. When we do see failures, a lot of times it's, it's basically a plier error where they sort of missed an area or didn't get around the backside, particularly with the coprophilia maintenance. We've roughly calculated how much time it takes us to treat corals. On average, it's about 16 minutes per coral. That includes the search time, the measuring, the data collection, the tagging, um, and the treatment as well. Um, a couple not particularly surprising observations, larger corals take more time. Also, the coral density really matters. Um, you can see back in the, on the lower graph there where we had really low coral cover. Um, it could take us 30 to 50 minutes to treat a coral. And most of that is search time, looking for any sort of priority coral that would be suitable for treating. So now that we're a year in, we've been able to fate track a lot of these colonies and see what happens after that initial treatment. So about 39% of those corals have remained diseased for six months or more, up to a year, um, which tells us that had we never been able to go back to that site, we would expect about 39% of those corals to still be totally fine. We never had to do any more work on them. An additional 23% we needed to do one or two touch-ups on. So we go back at one month and then uh, every two months after that. So by doing that one month checkup and uh, treating any new lesions that popped up, and then maybe again a second touch up, we were able to save an additional 23% of corals that have been fine ever since then. And then we sort of have these problem children, this 36% that are the either repeat offenders, they're just diseased all the time, or um, what we call unpatterned, where they look fine for a little while, but then they show disease a little bit later. So those are the ones that we spend the majority of our time on. So all that sort of leads us to our, our best recommendations. Um, and that's just select sites and corals based on your particular goals and priorities, thinking about the level of infection at the site and the potential for reinfection. Apply the topical amoxicillin with the base 2P um, to the lesions, expecting about 85% effectiveness. And then that revisitation, particularly the one month revisitation is really valuable for halting new lesions. And then if you can do follow-up monitoring every two months, that allows you to save even more corals. Uh, we always get lots of questions about antibiotic considerations. What are the impacts of that to the environment? Um, and the fact is a lot of that is really unknown. We've got a workshop uh, this week and next week that are going to start to uh, think about how to address some of those questions. Um, but just to give you sort of the scale of what we're looking at, the amount that an adult human takes when you get a prescription for antibiotics for an infection uh, is the same amount we use to treat nine corals. Um, an adult pig in large square, large scale aqua, um, agriculture uh, gets prophylactically treated with the equivalent of 28 corals. Um, we've done some really back of the envelope calculations to think about how much is in the environment from this compared to other things. Um, we roughly estimate that we're at our most treated site, putting in about five times as much um, as a, a average six months on a highly visited snorkel reef. Um, multiply by three, and that's the amount that is estimated to be coming out of one sewage outflow pipe up in southeast Florida. Uh, and then the scale, for example, of uh, Atlantic salmon aquaculture is, is significantly higher than that. So this just sort of puts that into a perspective of, of the amount that's going out. Um, we've highlighted here three, con three potential concerns. Um, we don't have really any data on or, or answers to these. Again, this is a topic that'll be coming up this week, but we do have a few anecdotal observations that I'll add here. Uh, one is what might the effect be of antibiotics on the coral microbiome? Would we expect large scale mortality because of those, um, those changes to the microbiome? Um, this is a topic of research right now, but we have noticed that uh, there is, well, we've documented that there's no difference in uh, reinfection rates between controls and treated colonies. We also have not noted observations of other diseases throughout the years since treatment. So for example, black band or um, white plague have not appeared on these corals. What are the effects of antibiotics on the surrounding organisms? Um, this is super anecdotal. We do do um, rough surveys, just a, a visual inspection of the area around those corals. There have been no notable die-offs, diseases, or other visible changes in the surrounding organisms. That's not to say there might not be changes there, but we're not seeing them uh, with, with the eye. Uh, what is the concern of increased amoxicillin-resistant genes in the ecosystem? Uh, a, a really basic pilot study was done um, that showed 
resistant genes in two of 24 post-treatment samples. This particular resistant gene is pretty common in people, pets, and food items as well, um, but it does emerge here, which is a potential topic for conversation. Um, and it's recommended that a larger sample size and a temporal, temporal component be added to a study like this to assess the risk. Uh, so there's lots of work that's still ongoing with this. Uh, we're looking into whether we can target feed uh, organisms, but oh, sorry, infected corals with, uh, with antibiotic. Val's going to talk about her really cool probiotics work. Um, and then if a pathogen can ever be identified, there might be some uh, potential to look at phage therapy as a future option. So we'll have Q&A after this, but my contact information is up here. Uh, and feel free to reach out if you have any questions that aren't answered this afternoon. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Karen. Um, I see lots of great questions coming in in the question box. We will we will look at those after all four presentations and cover those that, that haven't been addressed in the presentations, try to get through them. So next up, we have Dr. Marilyn Brandt. Um, Marilyn is a research associate pro, research associate professor of professor of marine and environmental science at the University of the Virgin Islands. She has a bachelor's degree in biology from New York University and a PhD in marine biology and fisheries from the University of Miami. She moved to St. Thomas and joined the University of the Virgin Islands as a professor in 2010. And her, her research there has focused on understanding the impact of disease on U.S. Virgin Islands coral reefs. She teaches and mentors undergraduate and graduate students at UVI and leads the Virgin Islands Reef, Virgin I, VI Reef Response, a coral restoration program based at UVI. Marilyn, let's hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Dana. Um, can you hear me okay and see my presentation? Yes and yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you again for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm really excited to be showing some very preliminary information, but um, just also sharing our story here. So as Dana mentioned, I'm in, at the University of the Virgin Islands in St. Thomas. So the Virgin Islands, if you're not familiar, is um, a little east of Puerto Rico. So we are in the Caribbean. We are a U.S. territory. Uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands is composed of three main islands. So St. Thomas and St. John in the north, and then St. Croix in the south. Uh, the population, combined population of these islands is a little over 100,000 people. So as a territory compared to other territories like Puerto Rico or states like Florida, Florida, we have a much lower population and therefore sort of more um, limited resources to respond to things like coral disease outbreaks. Uh, but I am very proud of what we've done, which I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about today. And I think it could give some good perspective for how small islands can respond to um, the outbreak of uh, stony coral tissue loss disease. So our first confirmed observation of um, the disease was at the end of January. So this was an observation that was made that we went uh, and confirmed my group out at Flat Key, which is um, an offshore key south of St. Thomas, actually just directly south of the university. So you can see that there in the red star. Over the course of the next month, we went out and tried to figure out the spatial distribution of the disease. Uh, it, it appeared um, the red dots indicate survey locations where the disease was present. The green dots indicate survey locations where the disease did not appear to be present. So these were roving surveys. Um, a lot of these locations are also locations that are long-term monitoring, coral reef monitoring stations for the Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program or TCRIMP program here in the Virgin Islands. So that program has been going on since 2002. It's funded by the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program through the Department of Planning and Natural Resources here in the territory. There's 33 monitoring locations. Um, about half of them are in the Northern Virgin Islands. You can see here on the map and Flat Key is one of those stations. So we started to look at the impact of the disease at these monitoring locations, of course, when it first started, when the disease popped up. Uh, one of the ways to do that is we have six permanent transects at each station and we record coral cover with video transects. Um, I'm gonna just show you data from that one location, Flat Key, where it, the disease uh, sort of appeared at, at the start. Um, so this is a graph going back to 2005 of coral cover or percent cover of living coral on the substrate. Um, you can see back to 2005, there's pretty high coral cover at Flat Key. 
I've split the coral cover up into a uh, percent of the cover that's highly susceptible species, uh, intermediately susceptible species, and low susceptible species. So Karen went through that some species are more or less susceptible to this disease. Um, and you'll see that we had one big event at Flat Key in the time of monitoring. So that was between 2005 and 2006, and that was due to a disease outbreaks related to a mass bleaching event of 2005. That kind of affected most of the species equally. So our last survey at Flat Key was actually in December of 2018, where we did not observe any disease, and coral cover really hadn't changed from the previous year of 2017, which is sort of surprising because we all went through um, two back-to-back -back, uh, Category 5 hurricanes, but Flat Key is a little deeper, and we think that may have protected this location. So we instituted monitoring or re reinstituted um, monitoring at that location right after we observed the disease. And even by January, even just a month's time, we've seen a decline in coral cover. We've since continued monitoring at this location. And as you can see, coral cover has just really tanked at this site. Um, but primarily, this has been due to the loss of highly susceptible and intermediately susceptible species the species not really susceptible to this disease don't seem to be changing. So this is a really serious situation, unprecedented in our monitoring lifetime here in St. Thomas. Um, and we had known about the disease prior and we had been in discussion with DPNR about how to respond to this disease. So we were lucky in the sense that we had already been having talks about how to respond to disease. We were also lucky that the Department of Planning and Natural Resources or DPNR has a coral reef initiative coordinator and that person was Leslie Henderson who kind of took the lead on trying to organize a response. So she gathered the Virgin Islands Coral Reef Advisory Group um, that is composed of local nonprofits, federal and state agencies or territorial agencies, the university um, and other interested groups in science and management of coral reefs. Uh, from that group, which was pre-existing, and that was, again, a, a really important point. It was a pre-existing coalition. Uh, we developed the Virgin Islands Coral Reef, um, sorry, Coral Disease Advisory Committee. And that committee has now been we meeting weekly since basically March of 2019 to discuss um, the disease response. So that includes every week we talk about the diseases distribution, research, communications to the public, uh, how to manage data that's being collected on the disease, um, the potential for a coral rescue program, like what's happening in Florida, and then most relevant to this presentation, um, discussions of strike teams and intervention. So that's what I'm going to mainly focus on. So strike teams developed pretty early on. We had a lot of people who were interested in doing something about this disease, so there were a lot of volunteers. I'm happy to say we now have strike teams for all three islands, um, partially funded in some cases, not funded in other cases, but at least um, we have some bodies to 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 respond to this threat. Um, I'm also very happy to say that we now have an officially hired coral disease response coordinator for the territory, Joe Townsend, um, who's a graduate of our master's program here at UVI, has taken over that role just in the last two weeks. Um, so um, he's going to be helping to organize strike team activities. A crucial part to this, um, this strike team is sort of mapping the distribution of the disease so that we know where to do the interventions. Um, so obviously, the disease first emerged on St. Thomas. It still has not been seen on St. Croix, thankfully, but we have been mapping its distribution. So this um, animation I'm going to show was uh, data from the Coral Disease Advisory Committee. It was put together by Ashley Rufo and Kitty Edwards. Uh, Ashley's with NOAA and Kitty's with DPNR. So I'm just going to show you this has been the spread of the disease since its initial observation in the southwest of St. Thomas. So it's in about a year's time, it's um, made its way, sort of following prevailing currents, and then kind of made a jump around the island. And as of March 1st, uh, it's almost all the way around uh, St. Thomas, and it has hit St. John. So this was crucial to knowing where the disease front is, so that we can kind of focus our intervention efforts there. Um, so now I'm going to get to a little bit of what we've done for interventions. Uh, just as a point of advice, it's taken us a long time to get organized. So if you are in a territory or island or uh, island nation or um, other area and interested in preparing, it's good to have things in advance because um, it's been a year and we really have only just started to get these interventions in place. Um, so one of the things that we did do, and this is like 
developed, really evolved from a lot of um, information that Florida has already done and what Karen Neely's group has done and all these great groups working there have done. Um, we developed a protocol that would work for us. So um, this protocol is, is focused on treating individual corals. So one of the first things we ask is how big is that infected coral? If it's greater than 30 centimeters, then we're gonna treat it in place. If it's less than 30 centimeters, one of the things that we've been trying that was not tried in Florida is we've actually been removing that entire colony. So then we have a protocol for doing that. Um, this is essentially culling that colony. Um, what that looks like is, this is a video of Sonora Myling, who's a researcher here at UVI, removing a coral from the reef. It's not for the faint of heart. It's very difficult to do this underwater. Basically, we just chisel, chisel the coral off at the base so that we try not to disturb the living tissue. Uh, we then immediately place the coral into a Ziploc bag and seal that bag and then put it into a container for transport to the surface. Uh, we usually need to use lift bags or surface support to transport these corals because they are corals and they are heavy. Um, so we don't, we are not doing this at a huge scale on a reef. And again, we're trying to only do it for corals that you could potentially place in a Ziploc bag. Um, so culling has really occurred at three main sites on St. Thomas. Um, and those sites were the, the sites of the disease front as of January. So we started really intensively culling in January. Um, even with a big team, we've, we've culled basically 68 corals from these sites. <clears throat> Of those corals, the ones that are really far gone, so um, almost fully dead, we tend to bring back and um, soak in bleach water and then dry for use, uh, hoping to use the skeletons for uh, future restoration activities. The rest we bring into the lab and we actually try to treat. So the goal of, of taking these corals off of the reef is to try to remove the pressure of the disease on that reef. But obviously we're removing um, rugosity from the reef or, or topography from the structure from the reef and other things. So what we're trying to do is either save that coral or at least use the structure in the future. So um, what we've been doing with the corals that have enough tissue left is we've been doing amputation experiments. So what that means is we bring the coral in, we photograph it, obviously we make a record of it. Um, this is my technician, Adam Glan, doing um, a lot of this work. Adam then uh, saws off the lesion using a bandsaw. And we usually uh, saw that lesion off about one to two centimeters into the living tissue that's remaining, um, trying to get that whole lesion part. We then seal the cut using modeling clay so that it's not an open wound. And then we've been placing that coral into a separate container with flow through water that's filtered. Um, and so it's basically put into spa-like conditions. We've only done this for uh, the first batch has been 28 corals. Uh, we're working on a second batch now. I'm just gonna show you some of the success uh, or the, the results of that. So, so for the corals that we've treated, we've had pretty good survivorship. So this is survival curves, around 80% survival. This is a little bit of a misleading graph because I have untreated an untreated line here, but that's just actually the other half of the coral that was sawed off with the lesion. And so that other half obviously does not do very well. We have very low success in that half surviving, but we, we like to monitor it. Um, there's been several different species we've done this with. So of those 28 split up like this. So only a couple of Dendrogyra, um, eight Montestra cavernosa, 14 Meandri uh, Meandrina meandrites, and then four Deploria labyrinthiformis. So not an equal sample size, but at least it's some kind of inform uh, information. So split up by species, um, Dendrogyra here, we've had really good success. Both of them survived. Uh, Montestra cavernosa, pretty good success again, 80% survived. Um, the Floria labyrinth performance was actually struggled in the lab. We haven't had good survival with them. Um, and Meandrino, we have had pretty good survival. And I actually like to note that um, three of the species, the untreated section obviously died completely. Um, but interestingly for Montastria cavernosa, the untreated section in some cases uh, did actually survive. So the lesions stopped progressing, even though the lesions were progressive at the beginning. So that's what we've been doing for culling um, in terms of what happens if the coral stays in place. So if it's a larger than, you know, sort of a dinner plate size, uh, we ask the question how much of the coral is remaining because we are limited in resources. So um, if 
less than 50% of that coral is remaining. Uh, we try to treat other colonies first and return if there's time. Um, if there's greater than 50% remaining, then we, we do try to target as many corals as we can uh, with the that show disease. Early on, we didn't actually, we couldn't get the base GB and amoxicillin very quickly here. Um, so we were just amputating the lesion. I don't have very good data for what happened after that. Um, I have more information for um, when we were able to acquire the amoxicillin and base GB. Um, we have started tagging corals and following them through time. So I can show you some of that information. So again, the three main locations that we're doing this, um, there are other locations being treated, but these are the ones where we're actually tagging the corals. And um, they were at the disease front at the start of this, or I'm sorry, in by January. So the treatment started in January. We've tagged 124 corals at these locations, about 50% of, of what's actually been treated. So we only tag a certain number um, to follow through time. So what are the fates? Well, unfortunately, we're not having as great success as Karen in the Keys, and we're not sure if that's because of a more virulent disease or um, error in applying the amoxicillin. You know, we are still fairly new to this, uh, but only 11% of the corals that we've been treating have been halted. The lesions have been halted. I mean, a good 40% are pending because we just have been implementing some of these. Uh, it has varied by site. So this site on um, the Northwest had much less success than the site in the Northeast. Um, and again, this other site, really, we just started implementing treat treatments there because it just became diseased. So we're not sure if this is a site specific difference or has to do with the species that we're treating at each of these locations because there are differences in species composition. So Pseudodiporia strigosa is more abundant at this whole day, um, this northwest location, compared to um, this other location northeast side where we were treating more in the Andrina. So um, we should have more information on that soon since this new site has a lot more Pseudodiporia strigosa and the Andrina. Um, so we should be finding out more. But it, we're definitely having differences from Florida, and we, we just are not completely sure uh, what's what's influencing that. So you may have more or less success depending on you know your location. But what we do know is that this thing is fast. So this is an untreated coral kind of from the beginning of the outbreak. Um, and man, this coral was big. You can see this dive weight in the lower left photograph to show the size of the coral. And within a month, it was completely dead. Um, that's you know, lends itself to you really have to go back and retreat some of these corals. And sometimes we just didn't have the personnel to do that on time. So that's been a big learning curve of where to put your efforts. We've also been trying some of the experimental treatments from Ocean Alchemist. Um, we've treated 51 corals at two different sites. We haven't had very much success yet, but we're redeploying or we're deploying some new treatments next week that um, I'm really excited about. And Mike will tell you a little bit about uh, in the next presentation. So how do we know if these interventions, the culling, the treatments are making a difference at kind of the reef level? We're giving you some information about how they're affecting the corals at the coral colony level. Um, but what we're trying to also assess is how is disease being affected at the reef level? So we have paired sites where no treatments are being applied. These are the yellow stars. Um, and we are collecting disease incidence data at all, at all sites in order to compare. So how are we collecting that data? So we have marked corals and we perform a radial transect. So this is again, Sonora doing um, a radial transect, collecting uh, data on observation or data on the presence of disease on corals surrounding this marked coral. Um, we, we do these surveys bi-weekly um, and what we're in the middle of doing surveys right now. So what we hope to do is compare disease incidents between treated and untreated sites. So, you know, we're, we're still pretty early on in this. Um, this disease has been very devastating. Uh, we've had an incredible response here in the Virgin Islands that I'm very proud of. Uh, one of the things we just recently launched is all SCTLD related information to the US Virgin Islands and that you can find that at vicoraldisease.org. You can find um, the spatial spread map there under tracking. If you are in the Virgin Islands and you want to report an unhealthy looking coral, you can um, report it on a report sighting tab. Um, so I just encourage you to check out uh, any new information we, we find out we're going to be putting on this website. So 
So I, I'd like to thank um, the organizers of this for the opportunity to present. I'd also like to thank the funding and then just the army of people who have been invo involved in this response. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Marilyn. Okay, moving on to Mike Favreau. Um, Mike is the CSO and joint owner of Ocean Alchemists, LLC, which formulated and supplies this base 2B ointment that you all have been hearing about um, in, in Karen and in Maryland's presentations, um, along with multiple investigational systems for the treatment of stony coral tissue loss disease. He's also currently a pharmaceutical drug development scientist at CoreRx Pharmaceuticals, which is the company who supplies the facilities and lab equipment for Ocean Alchemists and has expertise in novel drug development and drug delivery. His educational background is in chemical and biomedical engineering with a bachelor's in chemical engineering and a master's in biochemical engineering. So with that, Mike, take it away. Hello all, um, as she has just stated, my name is Mike Favero. I am the CSO of Ocean Alchemist and a drug development scientist for Corex Pharmaceuticals. I'm a co-inventor of Base 2B ointment, which is regularly utilized with amoxicillin to treat stony coral tissue loss disease throughout the Keys and Greater Caribbean area, islands. As the job title implies, I'm an expert in the realm of drug development with an emphasis on formulating drug delivery systems. Most of my background is firmly based in development for the pharmaceutical industry. However, one of my life goals is to further my reach into developing treatments for the natural world, which I am I'm quite ecstatic to have been presented the opportunity to do so through this relief effort. CoreRx Pharma is a contract research organization that specializes in taking promising active compounds and formulating drug delivery systems to create fully realized pharmaceuticals. This includes formulations, analytical testing, and manufacturing of ointments, tablets, suspensions, and many other means of targeting the active molecule to the desired location in the body. In this case, that would include the coral, uh, the coral tissues. The Florida Aquarium contacted Corex about the possibility of providing aid towards the treatment of SCTLD. After a brief introduction, the Corex farm formulations team swiftly mobilized into action and has continually donated time and resources towards a collective goal of design, designing a successful disease treatment. In time, CoreRx scientists formed a separate organization to continue research efforts in ointment production for SCTLD, still employed at and using CoreRx pharmaceuticals, Ocean Alchemist scientists are a sapling organ, organization mentored by CoreRx that are devoted to duplicating the successful techniques, methodology, and equipment used in the pharmaceutical energy industry for environmental causes. So what are the, uh, the roles and considerations for, um, oh, excuse me, for our drug del delivery systems? Uh, the goal of my presentation is to provide a bit of insight into the field of drug development and drug delivery systems and the importance of approaching any drug treatment plan from a formulation scientist approach. Regardless of species or ailment, a proper drug delivery system must first be formulated to have any chance of success. To do so, there is a multitude of active compound chemistry along with intra and external chemistry that must be understood. The bulletin points located on the right list just a few of the concerns that must be addressed. Starting from the outside in, what are the external conditions and chemistry which mediate it? Will the formulation and accompanying active compounds be subjected to air, heat, UV light, water, currents, is this environment ionic, lipophilic, or acidic? Continuing this approach internally, the same questions must be asked, along with several more complex questions. Does the drug need to penetrate multiple tissue layers, including mucosal epithelial tissues? Is the target ionic gate control? One of the answers, once the answers to these questions and many others are known, they may then be applied to active compounds of choice and what effects they might have on it. More than likely, multiple environmental factors will cause active compound degradation, along with the presence of multiple chemical hurdles which must be overcome. For example, many useful active compounds are hydrophobic and need to get through several layers of hydrated tissue. This is where the role of excipients in drug delivery system comes into play. They are a paramount necessity in virtually any drug treatment system. 
Excipients are a vast list of additional compounds which provide ways for the active compounds to be able to overcome all the obstacles previously mentioned. For example, an excipient class known as surfactants may be utilized to encapsulate hydrophobic compounds, allowing them to pass through hydrated membranes with ease until being released upon reaching the desired lo location. The image located in the bottom left provides a visual of how this is accomplished. The white circular head groups of surfactants are hydrophilic, while their gold tail groups are hydrophobic. You can hide that molecule inside a micelle like this and do a delivery. A simple way to better understand excipients may be acquired by comparing a fully formulated drug delivery system to a chocolate chip cookie. This may sound odd, but in this analogy, the chocolate chips may be considered the active compounds. The sugars, butter, flour, and eggs may all be considered excipients. As you may well know, the relative concentrations of these, including sugars and flour types and whatnot, as well as mixing times and baking principles, all have a massive effect on the final product, of course. Without them, you, you merely have semi-sweet chocolate chips. You don't have a cookie. So moving on, uh, this will be an example of exactly how that works. This slide provides a perfect example of the critical nature of excipients. The orange line represents the delivery of amoxicillin to an aqueous media via passive diffusion by base 2B core ointment. The blue line represents amoxicillin diffusion from another fully realized drug delivery system created by Ocean Alchemist with a faster dissolution profile. The red line represents amoxicillin diffusion from shea butter on its own. These results show how the diffusion of amoxicillin may be modulated through the formulation of excipients in, in an ointment as well as providing proof that without proper excipients and concentrations, no amoxicillin is diffused as is the case in the shea butter example. So how does this coincide with combating stony coral tissue loss disease? Understanding the necessity of how having utilized a fully realized drug delivery system is paramount to the successful treatment of SCTLD. Due to the vast number of oceanic variables, as well as its infinite sink conditions, not utilizing such would make successful treatment impossible. Equally detrimental is the notion that attempting to utilize different active compounds without one will likely result in false negatives, possibly leading to the dismissal of active compounds, which may have had the ability to successfully medicate. The current approach in developing a fully realized formulation is to borrow techniques utilized for drug delivery to the sublingual membrane of the human mouth. Here, there is plentiful saliva and tongue movement, which is somewhat analogous to the current driven oceanic water. Secondly, drugs targeting this area must pass through a mucosal membrane, pseudostratified epithelium, a basement membrane, and be uptaken by blood vessels surrounding the interstitial fluid. This chart over here gives a better understanding a little bit closer up is exactly all the barriers that a drug will have to pass through. Here is an anatomical drawing of something that is likely far more familiar to most participants compared to the sublingual membrane. As can be seen, the tissue layers are somewhat analogous depending on the tissue target. You can see here, based on this versus the previous slide, you can see that there is indeed somewhat analogous uh, nature between the two. This is a, a, a common topic that we run into. Uh, one could be forgiving for thinking of using products already available to reef aquarium enthusiasts which regularly treat bacterial infections in their tanks with a variety of products. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, none of them are equipped with a fully realized drug delivery system. Each is designed merely to, do to dose the water column in high enough concentrations to create therapeutic effects. The principles of diffusion dictate that dosing the water column for wild curls would be nearly impossible and potentially disastrous, even if funds and resources would be available to do so. On to how Ocean Alchemist is combating the issue. Instead of dosing the water column, Ocean Alchemists are developing a multitude of formulated techniques to target coral tissue specifically. This includes adding artificial mucosal adhesives designed to create a continuous layer between the active ointments and the coral colonies. When the deposit, when the deposited at the lesion line, the continuous mucosal layer allows for a roadway for active ingredients to fall into the coral mucus. Multiple additional techniques, including mucosal penetration, dose concentration, and nonlinear diffusion time dependency techniques are currently being analyzed for effectiveness. These techniques are being paired with a variety of active compounds, which are actively being tested by Karen Neely and Marilyn Brandt's teams to hopefully provide a multi 
a multitude of options for marine scientists to choose from. Through CoreRx, we, we, we have the ability to have access to a large number of highly sensitive and highly useful equipment. Uh, long before deployment, ointments are first analyzed by, by us utilizing state-of-the-art equipment at CoreRx. This equipment can help monitor time-dependent diffusive profiles, membrane permeability, viscosity, along with a variety of other attributes. Ocean Alchemist is currently utilizing this equipment to analyze the beginning stages of what whole colony treatment techniques might look like and how they may differ from the current syringable lesion-based treatments. One of, the most, one of our most common utilized analytical techniques is the use of the UV-Vis spectrometer. Here you can see a dissolution vessel which is filled with 1,000 mils of water held at specified temperatures. Known quantities of ointment are adhered to substrates such as skeletal coral wedges, which are added to the vessel subjected to constant known stirring rates. The diffusion of active compounds from the ointment is then analyzed over long ranges of time to determine how different excipient concentrations and production techniques affect diffusion rates. This knowledge is then utilized to either match a pre-existing treatment regime or create new ones with confidence. The image to your right is our newer technique, which is a, a, a better way of monitoring compared to where we had first started. Uh, Karen touched on this a bit, but I will go into it a, a bit more from, uh, from the chemistry side. As mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, I'm a co-inventor of base 2B, which is utilized with amoxicillin. We're happy to supply the ointment to anyone that would like to utilize the treatments and are happy to field any questions you may have. A common topic of conversation utilizing such revolves around how long amoxicillin remains on the reef. Before continuing, it's important to note that any amoxicillin not uptaken by the corals is quickly dissolved into the water, water and becomes dispersed beyond quantifiable levels. For further safety, we did, however, conduct several amoxicillin degradation studies to determine how long it could remain viable in the absence of sink conditions in the worst case scenario. Our studies indicate that amoxicillin degrades at approximately 2% per day, both in seawater and in the ointment. This means amoxicillin should never be added to the base, that is base 2B, long in advance of when it may be actively deployed. That is because, of course, you would be starting to degrade the amoxicillin. Secondly, I would like to point out that this was in the absence of UV light, which is a known degradative factor to amoxicillin. As mentioned previously, much of our current work involves providing alternative bases for both amoxicillin and other active compounds. We are continuing to research which functional excipients are the most beneficial along with their respective concentrations. And in total, over the past year, we have made well in excess of 80 active compound delivery system pairings, only the best of which have been sent for active treatment to either Karen's team or to Maryland's team. In addition, we are also looking towards the future of what this effort might look like. We are very aware of the exhaustive efforts currently needed to save these corals and are investigating several ways by which these efforts might be reduced. Currently, we are investigating preliminary studies on how we can apply a formulation to burlap cloths and nets which may be rolled out over large areas covering multiple corals at a time. Incisions may be made to cut around gorgonians and other non-affected species with relative ease. These nets or cloths would be temporarily tacked to the reef and removed after a short treatment period. Right now, we are targeting between one to three days as far as how long these treatments would take. The most important takeaway I would like to ensure participants and viewers of this presentation is that solutions to combat this disease it, do exist and there are likely a multitude of them, but the proper approach must be utilized to find and employ them. Active treatment of wild marine organisms is a field somewhat in its genesis with immense potential. And like all such endeavors, progress, growing pains are, excuse me, progress and growing pains are inevitable. Through a collaborative effort, we are confident this is an issue we will solve and will likely lay the groundwork for how future intervention is approached. I'd like to thank both the host and viewers for the opportunity to speak and would humbly ask that you keep a positive outlook and consider striving to continue collaborative efforts with professionals outside your immediate field. There is much to gain from both parties in doing so. 
please feel free to contact me either by phone or email regarding thoughts or collaborative opportunities for, for SCTLD treatment or any other environmental issues that may need a drug delivery system development. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. On to our last presentation of the day before we um, hand, take some, some questions from the participants, Dr. Valerie Paul. Um, Valerie has been the head scientist at the Smithsonian Marine Station at Fort Pierce, Florida since 2000. She received her PhD in marine biology in 1985 from the University of California, San Diego, Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Valor, Valerie previously served on the faculty of the University of Guam Marine Laboratory from 1985 to 2002. Her research interests include marine chemical ecology, marine plant herbivore interactions, marine cyanobacteria, coral reef ecology, and marine natural products. Valerie was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Coral Science in 1996 and served as chair of the Marine Natural Products Gordon Research Conference in 2000. In 2019, she was selected as the Silver Medal Award recipient by the International Society of Chemical Ecology and was elected an American Society of Pharm Pharmacognosy Fellow. She received the Paul J. Schooner Award in Marine Natural Products in 2020. She is author or co-author of over 290 scientific research papers and review articles. Okay, Valerie, you are up. Th thank you. And can everyone see my screen and hear me? Please. Yes. We Yes, we can. Yes. And I'm just going to remind everybody else to please um, make sure you're on mute. Thank you. All right. Well, awesome. Thank you. And thank you to all those excellent presentations this afternoon and to, uh, and to everyone who's taking the time to listen today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our efforts for probiotic development uh, uh, for treatment of stony coral tissue loss disease. And I want to acknowledge my co-author, Blake Ushijima, a, a marine microbiologist who's been working here at the Smithsonian Marine Station with us for the last couple of years and has been a, a really uh, immense, immense contributor to this work. But also, uh, I'm going to start right off acknowledging that this is a big team effort and there's a lot of us involved from the chemical ecology lab in terms of actually um, isolating and characterizing some of the antibiotics we're finding in these microbes as well as uh, microbiology and the uh, uh, immense efforts of the coral husbandry group, just keeping everything together. And then my collaborators, our work started in 2017, almost about three years ago exactly, uh, working on uh, stony coral tissue loss disease with an NSF rapid grant. And uh, Gret that brought Greta Abbey and um, Julie Meyer and Claudia House, and there's Julie and Claudia uh, and uh, all of us and this is Blake, uh, of course, um, together to uh, start working on this. And so it's been a good team effort and we've been working together ever since, as well as uh, a whole team of other people from throughout the state. Um, as we heard at the very beginning, this is a big collaborative effort and everyone's uh, efforts uh, have been greatly appreciated who worked together on this. So in terms of our approach, uh, we wanted to understand stony coral tissue loss disease better. At the time we started on this in 2017, it uh, was obviously recognized as a problem already, but we really didn't know very much about it. We started a couple of different approaches. Julie has been, uh, Julie's been leading a uh, sort of culture independent analysis uh, and a lot of their genomic analysis. So looking at microbiomes of these corals and how they differ among diseased and healthy, um, as you heard Karen mention, but also a culture dependent approach. And this has been really important for uh, two areas of research. One was trying to see if we could find um, the, the cause, the causative bacterium for, for stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, and the second was uh, for our probiotics approach to actually isolate some strains that might be beneficial. And that's uh, kind of what I'm going to focus on today. But I just do want to mention uh, Blake's work to try to isolate the pathogen or pathogens of this disease. And this was important because it has, while we did not um, succeed in finding a, a definitive causative organism, uh, we have found a number of strains that uh, sometimes cause tissue loss, including one I'll talk a little bit more about later called Vibrio which is a known coral uh, and oyster pathogen 
in the marine environment. But uh, it gave us a few strains of what we call putative pathogens, uh, things that cause tissue loss in, in the corals we've tested in aquarium assays some of the time, so maybe 10% to 50% of the time. And these, are, these have become some of our test strains, so they've been really important for uh, testing uh, for the efficacy of the, some of the pro probiotic bacteria. Uh, and this was the approach, basically an isolation and testing approach on corals, uh, testing in groups of bacteria at a time, just so that uh, not as many uh, corals were needed, and then uh, testing individual bacterial strains after that. We also wanted to test, and this is not, this was not for, again, this is before some of these uh, field interventions had really been developed, but this was designed as a diagnostic test to see if antibiotics halted the disease. And so in this case, we used a combination of amoxicillin and canamycin to cover as broad a, a spectrum of antibacterial activity as we possibly could. And if you just look across these time series, the top row are the controls. So these are matched um, pieces of uh, diseased coral. They'd be cut in half. And the top row, uh, the controls are just left to advance in the aquaria. And you can see that by the end of a week, in this case, this fragment is dead. Um, and then the amoxicillin canamycin treatment halted the disease. So this was the first um, real indication that bacteria were, were playing some role in this disease and that um, slowing them down with antibiotics could be important. So I do want to mention this co uh, Vibrio coralliticus that I mentioned earlier, uh, this known uh, coral pathogen. And we have isolated about four strains of this from Florida corals through the uh, isolation efforts I mentioned earlier. And these, uh, <clears throat> this assay that um, Blake and Claudia's uh, collaborator, Mike Marisich, developed has been really helpful in this regard. And it's just a rapid test kit, a colorimetric assay where you apply the, let's see if my cursor works, apply the um, a little bit of uh, coral mucus uh, diluted in some seawater or uh, a little bit of tissue mucus from the lesion, apply it here. It wor uh, works its way up the test strip. So the top band tells you that the, uh, the, the, the uh, test is, is accurate, that it's moved through the entire strip. And then I think you can see the test uh, signal, the, color, the colored band that indicates a positive test. And this is testing not for the bacterium itself, but for a toxin that it's known to make, that is uh, metalloprotease that is specific to Vibrio coralliticus, and it's what is causing some of the tissue breakdown, the tissue lysis that we see with Vibrio coralliticus and why it can be so toxic. <clears throat> the other thing about Vibrios, it's resistant to beta-lactam. It's like amoxicillin and can actively break it down and tolerate very high concentrations. So it's a kind of a, a bad one to be co-infecting. We see it in about 20% of the corals. And when we do see it, um, it is the, the fragments die much more quickly. So if you just compare the 50 or so coral fragments that we collected um, on the, in the black uh, color there, these are survival graphs like you've seen earlier in the webinar um, with the ones that are Vibrio coralliticus positive, you can see that they uh, die much more quickly if they're Vibrio coralliticus positive. So let's move on to talk about, then uh, uh, I'll come back to that as we talk a little bit more about the probiotics, but let's come back to uh, this coral, uh, the skittle treatments that we've heard about today. And we've heard, you know, some great talks with a lot of really practical uh, advice and um, heroic efforts in the field in many cases. Uh, Marilyn talked a little about, about colony removal. It can be done, but it's hard and it's not practical. And, um, I'm, you know, of course, the, taking every possible um, uh, consideration about you know, uh, not spreading the disease while doing it. The chlorine powder that has been tested in a couple of cases hasn't been um, uh, really optimized very much, but this would be a uh, most of what's been tested is a calcium hypochlorite powder in marine epoxy. And the amoxicillin, which Karen showed us some really good uh, data for, um, it's, it can be variable uh, at sites, but uh, certainly has been providing some effectiveness, the most effective treatment so far in, uh, in Florida. But, uh, you know, as we've heard, some, some uh, definite drawbacks with generation of antibiotic resistance and other considerations that, um, 
that must be taken into account, as well as a failure rate of about 15 to 20 percent, even under the best circumstances. Uh, and so, you know, one question we have is whether that Vibrio Coroliticus may play a role in that failure rate. We really don't know at this time. So this leads us to look at other alternatives. And I think Mike did a really good job of talking about how, um, you know, being creative and, and really thinking uh, about alternative treatments and, you know, credit to them for all that they've done to advance that cause is really, really important. And um, again, we were working uh, through, through a lot of the isolation efforts with a lot of different bacterial strains. And uh, so the notion of probiotics, which we of course are very familiar with in humans as well as aquaculture, um, was one that we wanted to try to advance more. And the potential advantages are of course uh, very uh, inexpensive costs to culture these up and uh, they can be ready to go in five to eight hours. They have the potential to provide lasting protection. Uh, to, at this stage, we don't know how long they might last, but ideally a probiotic treated colony uh, could have the uh, the bacterium incorporated into the microbiome and protect and la uh, provide some lasting protection, and also uh, slightly more complex treatments than a single antibiotic because we could have bacteria uh, acting by a number of different mechanisms, including competitive exclusion or uh, production of multiple antibacterials, uh, peptides, en enzymes, uh, etc. Uh, what, what we're looking for in the development is, of course, we don't want it to be harmful to the coral. That's kind of obvious. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, ideally, producing multiple uh, modes of action, multiple compounds, uh, not used in veterinary or human medicine for the antibiotic resistance uh, problem that we've discussed, and then can grow quickly and doesn't require complicated media. So. We now have uh, close, uh, close to 2,000 strains from healthy and more disease-resistant fragments of coral. So we're continuing the efforts to try to find these. Many isolates display antibiotic activity, and you can see these uh, clear zones, these zones of inhibition around some of these bacterial strains here, and that's where they're uh, keeping the bacteria on this lawn from growing up against competing. And then the isolates are from, coming from about six species. So our first bacterium that is um, providing uh, utility here is one we call, pseudo, pseudo, it's a pseudoaltramonas strain, but it's MCH17, and this is it here with a little arrow pointing to it. It makes a compound uh, known antibiotic, coromycin, which is actually really uh, interesting. It uh, affects most aerobic gram-negative bacteria. It affects the uh, energy uh, sodium, sodium pump in these, uh, in these bacteria and uh, is used a lot in vibrio cholera research. And it also produces an enzyme that has some antibiotic properties and tetrabromoparol, which is a small molecule that uh, has some antibiotic properties. It also uh, stimulates coral larval settlement. So that's an interesting um, thing to follow up on here that we hope to do in the future. And so in terms of safety testing, again, we don't want these probiotics to have any negative effect on the corals. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> when after inoculating the, um, piece of MCAV with the probiotic. 30 minutes later, you don't see any negative effects or anything. However, when we do it with Vibrio coroliticus, you can see the coral is producing all kinds of mucus and trying to slough off uh, this bacteria that some people they can perceive uh, to be negative. Testing the coral pieces with probiotics. Uh, across the top, you see an untreated control, similar to what I showed you before. If you don't treat these in uh, aquaria, they will, um, the disease normally proceeds. Sometimes, sometimes they will uh, heal themselves, but often proceed and uh, kill the corals. Uh, but here's one test, uh, a test strain <coughs> with MCH17, and you can see that it basically halts the disease progression. This is the bacterium now just incorporated into the water um, at uh, 10 to the 8th CPU uh, colony forming units. Um, per ml and uh, basically uh, can either slow or halt the disease in almost every case. So this was uh, pretty exciting. Uh, the other thing that was really interesting, and this graph is, a, uh, this figure is a little more complicated, so let me see if I can quickly walk you through it. Um, the first row in blue, first column in blue is untreated controls. And we see basically what we see before. If you put a healthy piece of a fragment of coral up against a disease fragment, you generally, generally get transmission. 
and in most of our MCAV cases, this varied from uh, 30 to 40 percent uh, all the way up to 100 percent. We got about uh, 33 percent in this case. If we take the disease fragment and put it up in the middle row in yellow, if or column in yellow, if we take the disease fragment, put it up against an MCH17 uh, treated uh, healthy fragment, the healthy fragments never became infected. Uh, and the green column is just uh, your uh, controls with no disease, just to show that there was no negative effect of putting the corals against one another. So th the main point here is the healthy fragments treated with MCH17 were protected from disease transmission. So this suggests there might be some prophylactic role here and something really definitely we're uh, interested in following up. So we managed to get through all our permitting and everything last fall and to do our very first field trial in January. Um, many, many thanks to Brian Walker's group at Nova Southeastern University who helped us with this uh, extensively. In fact, they had pre-tagged the entire site with the, um, and recorded and mapped the entire site before we even went out there. Um, and they had done that in September with the hope of either treating it themselves with antibiotics or waiting to see if we could get all the permitting for the probiotics. Unfortunately, we did. Um, the colonies are, have been monitored through March. Uh, again, thanks to Brian's team, because this all happened right when we were getting all shut down from COVID. And we've been tracking the community to see if we can uh, determine the presence of the probiotic in the coral microbiome after treatment. But the initial results have been interesting. Uh, I think this was a, uh, it taught us a lot of the challenges of doing this work in the field and um, some of the things we uh, will need to solve, as I'll mention in the next slide. But before we even, even went out there between September and January, almost half of the colonies, these are all MCAV, that had been uh, tagged by Brian Walker's team had healed. So uh, we had this elaborate uh, scheme of which ones to treat and which ones not to treat, uh, but many of them weren't diseased the day we actually went out to treat them. Uh, in terms of success, we had one Vibrio coralliticus positive coral that was completely healed after being treated. So this was pretty um, encouraging to us. Uh, <clears throat> three of seven colonies treated were, uh, were healed, but it was pretty similar for our controls. So we had um, uh, three background controls that also healed. And we had a lot of, a lot of issues that first day. Uh, the bags were lifting off, the bags were too big, so our concentrations were kind of low a little bit of everything. And so these are some considerations for future treatments. We're not at all discouraged. We're happy that uh, we don't see any negative effects and possibly some positive effects on, on a coral that we knew would be challenging to treat with Vibrio coralliticus uh, present. Um, but we're also developing some, uh, so, some lesion specific treatments that are a sodium alginate uh, based uh, paste that we can incorporate the probiotics into and also trying to work out some methods to freeze dry the probiotics for easier preparation for field work. Because right now we are constrained that the bacteria have to be grown the day before and then incorporated uh, into syringes for treatment the next day. So it's a little bit of a, some time constraints come with this right now. So let me just summarize for this uh, MCH17. We know that disease progression can be slowed or stopped. It can be used to treat healthy corals and the beneficial effects from healthy corals I didn't talk very much about this, may actually be transmissible to surrounding corals that they're in contact with. This Vibrio coralliticus as a co-infection is exacerbating all of our problems and so may be something to really follow up on more in the future. We have one other strain, I'll just mention it briefly, it's not as far along in development, but it's another Pseudoalteromonas that came off of a um, Morbacella fabiolata colony from Florida. And this produces some different compounds, thiomarinol, also a known antibiotic, a really uh, interesting one. And we were testing this one, uh, the, M the uh, MCH17 came off of an MCAV, this one came off of an OFAB. So we're testing this one in OFAB, but also comparing, uh, in this case, the species specificity of these, because um, the, uh, we don't know if how specific these bacteria are to the coral they came off of. So here we only have a few replicates, unfortunately. This was all done uh, right before the COVID lockdowns. So we're, we're gonna try and get our replication up on this, but you can see again that OF7M16 uh, imparts protection <clears throat> compared to the control. 
So that's uh, the end of what I wanted to say today, but we're continuing to, to optimize and develop these uh, really want to get out in the field more and start to test these, ideally down in the Keys where we have more corals to treat, and then uh, continuing to work on both the probiotics library that we have and looking at the po possibility of multi-probiotic treatment. So uh, I'll stop there and open up to questions. Great, thank you. So um, we, have, we have about five minutes to take questions from the group. Um, and so we are uh, gonna try to take a few of those, but again, reassure you all that um, we're gonna post these questions. We've been tracking them, we're gonna post them. Um, and our, our speakers um, are gonna try to try to answer your questions. So um, first question that came in here um, was from Aiden Guillermo, um, Jordan Garza saying, the disease signs are very similar to a white plague. Are you sure this is not some variant of a white plague. Who wants to take that? Um, this is Val. I mean, and that we don't really know the causative agent of white plague either. I mean, it's kind of uh, I mean, this, this case, this, this name stony coral tissue loss disease comes from the case definition, and you can find that on the NOAA website. I mean, it could be, uh, you could, could call it some form of white plague, but it definitely has a um, its potential to both destroy coral tissue quickly and uh, hop, you know, move rapidly through the water column makes it a bit unprecedented in that most outbreaks have a, a finite period. And this thing's been going on for five years, well, almost six years already. Okay, thanks. Um, several participants are asking where they can get the base to be. And I would just recommend that, um, you you contact Mike directly, so we will we will share his his email address um, with everyone. Um, yeah, that uh, email address at, that's at the end of the slide, the Ocean Alchemist at Gmail dot com, uh, will definitely be the best place to get in contact with us. Thanks, Mike. Andrew Stamper asks, why amoxicillin versus other antimicrobials? This is Karen. I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so it was actually just because it worked. Uh, we have not trialed additional drugs. Al mentioned that um, her and Blake had done a mix of amoxicillin and canamycin. The amoxicillin was used to water dose very, very sick dendrogyra and was effective. And so as we were working rapidly to try to figure out something that could be utilized in the field, we went with what worked. Okay, thanks. And Andrew Baker asks, is there any plan on testing antibiotics that are more effective against gram-negative bacteria, such as ribionolides? I think that's a great idea. We haven't done that and don't currently have any plans to, but I think there is consideration amongst all parties looking further into alternatives is a good idea. Okay. Uh, Lester Gittens asks, how much training is needed to prepare the antibiotic and base paste and to apply the antibiotic to corals in the field? I can speak to that, but Marilyn, you probably can too. Do you want to take that? Oh, the next one will definitely be targeted at Marilyn. Ah, okay. <laughs> I can take that then. Um, it's not particularly difficult. It does take a little bit of practice. Um, we find it's it's easier with people who just basic, they know their coral species, they know how to identify different diseases, they're comfortable underwater. Those are sort of the bigger issues to combat. Um, but in terms of just learning how to mix it together and apply it, it's it's really quite simple. We've done half day training in various groups um, that already sort of take those earlier qualifications about dive capability and species identification. And um, you know, there's a, a little bit of a learning curve in learning, figuring out how to do it, but full hands on practice, it's not hard. Okay, thanks. Um, Marilyn, Michael Studevin asks, were cold corals fate tracked ex situ or were they immediately euthanized following removal? Um, there was, the ones that were really far gone were immediately euthanized, but the others were, as I showed in the amputation sort of continued experiment have been used in the 
have been fate tracked through um, the the experiments that we're doing in the water tables. So those have all been like attempted to be saved in some way. Um, so we have not brought any corals that were culled into the water tables and just watched them to see what happened. Okay, and another one for you, Marilyn. If you cull corals that would really recover, aren't you removing genes that might generate resistant colonies? Um, yes, so the decision was made to cull early on because we thought we could potentially get a handle on the disease outbreak when it first started. Um, I think what we're trying to do is corals that we've tracked in the field that have this disease that are as far gone as the ones that we're pulling out of the water and basically um, euthanizing are 100% of them have gone to full mortality. Um, the ones that we take out of the water that we think would survive based on the experience of tracking corals in the field, uh, those are the ones that we're bringing in and trying to to potentially save, but even those we do have mortality from. Thanks. Roddy asks, looking at the various tested delivery systems listed in Mike's presentation, have these only been tested with amoxicillin as an active compound? Have these been tested with alternative treatments, chlorine, essential oils, et cetera? Mike, I'll let you take that. Sure, so this is a bit of an ongoing study um, they have been tested on multiple situations. Essential oils of, was one of them, of course. Uh, amoxicillin was one, of course, uh, as long as well as several others. However, uh, in order to pair the delivery systems with the particular drug, you can't do all things in one particular ointment. So that's where you get into situations, as I was stating, where we made well over 80 ointments uh, in this past year. Uh, simply because there are other characteristics between the ointments and delivery systems that are are not uh, are that are co-competitive, and those must be teased out first. And as we are continuing to do that, we send them down to either Karen or Marilyn Brands groups at the moment, and we hear feedback about how things are progressing. And from their answers, we kind of move in a particular direction. At the moment, we're looking more into penetrative effects rather than surface effects. Okay. Liz, can I squeeze in one last question? Sure, go for it. Okay. Uh, from Tanya Metz, have you been able to compare the microbial community of disease colonies from Guy and Florida? I'm wondering if you can confirm that what you're seeing in both jurisdictions is the same. So I can say that we, we received a rapid grant also to sample the corals for their microbial communities. Um, we had a grad student who was working on the mucus samples from the corals. She just finished her master's degree doing that. And um, on our team, we have Erin Muller, who's been helping to do a lot of microbial studies in Florida. So the intention is, yes, to compare those. Uh, that has not been done in a detailed manner enough to report the results as of yet. Okay, great. Well, I'm sorry we have run out of time for questions, but we're going to post all of these. Um, before we go, we'd actually like to get a sense for how you all would like to receive future information on stony coral tissue loss disease. And so we want to do a short poll question and get your input. Um, is that poll up on the screen? Yes, it is. So um, what types of information uh, on stony coral tissue loss disease would, be most, would, disease would be most useful for your work? You can select all that apply. Um, and if there's an, another really important need to support your work that's not on this list, you can feel free to insert that into the question box. So intervention action plans with treatment protocols, uh, materials to communicate and do outreach on stony coral tissue loss disease in your local communities or with decision makers, protocols for collecting disease tissue samples and storing those, demo videos to show you how to detect the disease, monitor for it and treat it, or um, disease response plans. So please submit your input on those. Um, and with that, just thank you very much to our four speakers. Um, it was really a comprehensive look at 
the efforts going on to treat this disease. Um, and thanks to all of you for participating in your great questions. And we'll continue to um, address those. Liz, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. Great, thanks so much, Dana. Um, and uh, we'd like to uh, continue the discussion from today's webinar by inviting everyone to go to the Reef Resilience Network Forum. Um, you can access the network forum through the link that's on the slide, or you can go to reefresilience.org and click on the tab that says Network Forum. If you're not a member yet, you can submit a registration form to join, and then you'll receive an email um, when your account has been approved. And uh, there are a lot of questions that we got from this webinar today. We've been keeping track of those, um, and our presenters have graciously offered to answer as many of those as they can. So we're going to be um, supplying those answers in a Word document that we'll um, put on the forum as well. And then finally, we have um, this slide for additional resources that you might find useful in trying to find more information about the stony coral tissue loss disease. These are several websites that provide um, and, and culminate a lot of resources about the disease. We'll be sending these uh, resources out along with the recording for this webinar out to our mailing list very soon. And with that, I wanted to thank the presenters as well. Thank you so much for your really informative presentations. And thank you, Dana, for hosting today and helping make this webinar happen. And then thanks to everyone who attended today. And we hope to see you on future webinars as well. Thank you very much.